never figure these things out. Oh, welcome to the Ken Lau Show. <laughs> Today's show talks about autofluorescence. And what is autofluorescence? Autofluorescence is the intrinsic fluorescence that's just given off by your cells. It's just sort of a natural um, property that they have. But you do have to consider this when you look at data because there are actually a lot of molecules that your cells are making that contribute to autofluorescence and you should look at it in your flow data. So let's take a quick look at this chart that'll come up and you can see all the different molecules that can contribute to autofluorescence. Okay, so here's this handy chart that we're looking at for autofluorescent molecules. So you can see that there are reduced pyridine nucleotides, or NADH, NADPH, oxidized flavins, FAD, lipofusions, which are sort of a granular yellow-brown pigment. Uh, it's a granule that's resulting from the breakdown and absorption of damaged red blood cells. It's also known as the aging pigment. Collagen and elastins can also contribute, and this one you may not know about, but it's for samples that you treat with formaldehyde fixatives because the cross links that it generates can actually make these autofluorescent type of molecules. So this is another reason why we suggest that you generally try not to overfix your samples. So the more active your cells are, the more likely they are to produce these molecules. So you can have varying levels of autofluorescence in your samples. If you take a look at the figure here, it shows the excitation and emission properties of these autofluorescent molecules. For excitation, you can see it's mainly excited by shorter wavelengths, and it will emit between 400 to 600 nanometers. So it can affect any channels uh, with floors that have similar emissions in this range. So now you have an understanding of some of the molecules that can cause this autofluorescence. But it might be more helpful if you can take a look at some data. So if you look at this data, uh, what it's trying to plot is GFP fluorescence. Uh, and normally, if you're looking at this in a histogram format, you might just draw your gate there and then call it a day. However, because these cells have some autofluorescence, they're actually contributing background noise into the FL1 and FL2 channels. You can see this if you plot FL1 versus FL2 in a bivariate. You'll then notice that it's a distinct diagonal uh, sort of pattern, which clearly indicates something's not quite right here. So instead of just drawing um, a misguided gate in your histogram, you might draw an actual gate here in the bivariate so you get something more accurate, uh, something that more reflects what your sample is actually doing. So then you might be asking yourself, how do I know what gate I should be drawing? And the easiest thing to do here is to use an unstained control. Having your uh, cells without any kind of antibody stain or anything else will let you know what the basal level of autofluorescence is in those cells. So you definitely should have something like that if you think autofluorescence will be a concern. Other people have tried to use something like Tripan Blue uh, to try and quench the autofluorescence, but there's no guarantee that that will always work. And it could also diminish your antibody's fluorescence signal as well. So there are some caveats to using that. In addition, something that we would probably recommend instead is maybe avoiding those channels altogether. Maybe try not to use any FITC or PE antibodies if at all possible. Instead, in your panel, shift everything sort of more to the near infrared region, get those longer wavelengths uh, into your panel so you can avoid those autofluorescent channels altogether. And uh, there are some other things you should consider, especially with your sample type, because not all cells are created equal. Much like Rudolph, uh, there he is, you know, Rudolph just happens to be naturally more sort of fluorescent in his nose than the other reindeer types. Similarly, uh, and by the way, it's the 50th anniversary of Rudolph's cartoon, so that's always a good fun fact. Uh, okay, Rudolph, I think we've had enough there. <laughs> Excellent. So just like Rudolph is a little more fluorescent than his companions, you should consider certain cell types. For example, dead cells will tend to be highly autofluorescent, not to mention they will bind to antibodies non-specifically, so you have to watch out for that including a viability dye is always a good suggestion for those situations. Myeloid cells also tend to be highly autofluorescent, as well as antigen-presenting cells. So your B cells, dendritic cells, macrophages can all fall under this category. In addition, you have to consider whether or not you're treating your samples in any way. 
giving the samples any type of drug or if the samples have to be infected, this can actually raise the metabolism of your cells and uh, create more respiratory burst, which contributes more of those autofluorescent molecules. So under those conditions, you should also be aware of what's going on. Now, it's not just a problem with flow. Microscopists also have to deal with a lot of autofluorescence issues uh, with the tissue samples that they're looking at. So we're not gonna delve into all the details here about that, uh, how to fix that, but you can check out the links below in uh, the bottom here, and you can find out more about how you might fix autofluorescence with microscopy samples. So that's everything we've got for today's episode. Be sure to like us on Facebook, um, subscribe to us on YouTube. We're also on Tumblr now, so that's great. And you can get all the fun facts you need. So enjoy, have a happy holidays, and we'll see you in 2015.